All right. So the program shows that I have three talks to deliver in this session. So I've taken the liberty of clubbing the first and the second talks together. And then if we are left with time, we'll go over to the third talk on dry eye or we could skip it. Right. So my brief was to speak on uh, ocular surface disorders for every ophthalmologist. This was planned as a sort of a keynote lecture and I was thinking about the topics that I should cover. And uh, this is what I have chosen. So my first two talks will be clubbed into this one talk. And we'll be talking about limbal stem cells in health and in disease. And the reason why I chose this topic is I felt that every ophthalmologist in India should know about this topic. Because offhand, if we talk about some of the major successes of Indian ophthalmology, which has uh, brought it into prominence worldwide, you could think of uh, intraocular tuberculosis, you could think of retinoblastoma, and you could think of uh, limbal stem cell transplantation. So these are the three major topics that I thought that have made a mark globally in terms of Indian ophthalmology, and one of them I've chosen to present here. Right. So this is a four-year-old boy who presented to us when I was uh, working with the LVPI at Hyderabad, and uh, he had suffered a chuna injury, as is very common across most of India. Uh, there are these chuna packets which suddenly burst and go into the eye, and this was about uh, four to five months before he came to us. The patient was from Maharashtra. They had the parents had sought uh, opinions at various places. They were frustrated, and they actually wanted just a cosmetic solution. So they were actually looking to get the eye out and get an artificial eye in and cosmetically rehabilitate this patient. And this is how the eye looked on fluorescein staining. And I'll come back to this picture again and see how this ties into our talk. But I just want you to keep this picture in mind while we go through the rest of the talk. So this is how an eye is supposed to look, a normal eye. And some of the structures here, the one I'm interested in is the limbus. So the limbus literally means the border or margin of a structure, okay, if you look at the origins of the word. So here in this context, we have the cornea, we have the conjunctiva, and what comes in between is the corneoscleral limbus. How do we identify this clinically? Well, we have the palisades, pigmented palisades described by Vogt. And in the Indian population, these are very easy to identify because the pigmentation is quite clear in a majority of our patients or subjects. In the Western population, sometimes these may not be very well pigmented. Even in India, sometimes we may not pick them up very uh, easily. But if you look at the patient on the slit lamp in high magnification, these are not difficult to identify. Why are we interested in this anatomical structure? Because it, has, it plays a major role in corneal epithelial healing. And I'll explain how. So if you have a patient who, due to any reason, has a central epithelial defect, in this case, it was a chemical injury, but it might be anything else. It might be a surgically created defect for cross-linking, for surface ablation, for whatever reason. So what happens normally? It heals, right? So this is what happens in a majority of the eyes that we see. If you have an epithelial defect, over a period of time, it will heal without any sequelae, without any scarring, and the cornea will remain transparent. So what is the source of the cells which come in and fill this defect? So there has been a lot of work in this area over the post past four or five decades, and this was an elegant hypothesis that explained how the turnover from the epithelial surface, the cells that are shed off, that rate is matched by the cells which migrate from the periphery towards the central cornea, and how those cells multiply in the periphery. So now we know for sure that uh, there are stem cells, epithelial stem cells, as well as mesenchymal stem cells in the area that we call the palisades of vote or the corneoscleral limbus. So whenever there is a need for fresh cells, and this is very often even in physiology, apart from pathology, these cells multiply and they undergo mitosis and turn into transient amplifying cells. These move more centrally and then they become what we call mature epithelial cells and form the five-layered epithelium that we are aware of. So this is physiology and that is how limbal stem cells work in health, right? And beyond this simplistic explanation, there have been a host of studies to conclusively establish the markers for limbal stem cells, and those can be found at the limbus. What are the markers that differentiate the corneal epithelium from the limbal epithelium, from the conjunctival epithelium? And the science is very, very strong. So this is not just theory. This is backed by very good evidence from the lab as well as from clinical studies. Now what happens in disease? 
So what is limbal stem cell deficiency? So quite simply, it is a pathological state which is caused by the destruction of the limbal stem cell or the alteration of their microenvironment, which we call the limbal niche, which includes the nerve supply, the blood supply, the supporting cells, all of that constitutes the limbal niche. So either of these is damaged and you have a relative deficiency, a complete or total limbal stem cell deficiency. Right? So look at this patient, which had again a chemical injury, an alkali burn, chuna injury, but you'll notice that in addition to the central corneal epithelial defect, there is confluent staining across the limbus onto the conjunctiva. So uh, what I want to highlight here is that this part of the limbus has been affected by the chemical injury. And therefore, when you see these patients on follow-up sequentially, you'll see that the cells from the surrounding limbus are trying to cover this epithelial defect and they are migrating to close this epithelial defect and this part will heal at the end because that is where the limbus is damaged. And eventually, if the patient is not very lucky, you'll end up with something like this where instead of the corneal epithelium coming in and healing that epithelial defect, you have the conjunctival epithelium that gets there first, overriding the limbus and coming onto the cornea. And this is classically what we call a partial limbal stem cell deficiency because you have conjunctivalization of the cornea. Rather than clear corneal epithelium, you have conjunctival epithelium which has covered that defect. So this is an example of partial limbal stem cell deficiency following a chemical burn. And if you follow the physiology, the pathology is very easy to understand. So what are the clinical features of LSCD? Well, you have indistinct palisades of vote. They are not very clearly seen. There might be vessels. There quite often are vessels on the cornea. You might have punctate staining in the early phases. In late phases, you might have a crater or a non-healing epithelial defect or a persistent epithelial defect. The cornea loses its luster. There is this fibrovascular panis or the conjunctival epithelium which comes on to the cornea, which has goblet cells if you look at it on pathology. And these are the hallmarks of limbal stem cell deficiency. This, if you look very carefully, is very early or very mild limbal stem cell deficiency where you can see the fine panis on the cornea and the uh, vessels. Some more examples. Uh, this is a gentleman who suffered a blast injury in a chemical factory. So you can see one, the right eye is completely white. The limbus, the cornea, all of that is affected, including the conjunctiva, which appears quite necrotic. The left eye also, the epithelium is sloughing off. There is already a stromal opacity. So even if we manage these according to the best possible therapeutic protocols, what uh, Dr. Chatterjee was describing, intensive steroids, amniotic membrane, tarsorafi, best case scenario is what we end up like this. So the right eye has, as you can see, conjunctivalization of the cornea pretty much 360 degrees. The left eye has some partial areas of the limbus where the conjunctiva is overgrowing on the cornea, but otherwise is well preserved. So one eye here has total LSCD, the other one has partial LSCD. But this is a good outcome in terms of management of acute chemical burns. If you end up like this, without a perforation, without a persistent epithelial defect, and the stroma is protected, this is a good outcome. Some other cases where you see other manifestations, this is a persistent epithelial defect, a PED which is stained with fluorescein. You have some accompanying conjunctivalization also there. You can see that a tarsorafi has been attempted in order to try to heal this defect. Another manifestation where the almost three quadrants of the cornea is covered by conjunctiva. This is also near total LSCD. And this kind of picture what uh, Dr. Fernandez was showing in one of her presentations on ocular allergy is when a patient has long-standing chronic severe VKC, it leads to destruction of the limbal stem cells and therefore you have this kind of panis which is there on the cornea, mostly in the superior part, but over a period of time can be pretty much across the entire cornea. So this is the other eye of the same patient and one eye has near total LSCD, the other eye has total LSCD. Again, a patient of VKC, this one post corneal transplant LSCD. So a variety of causes can lead to this sort of a picture. This picture is slightly different compared to the other pictures that I showed you. Because yes, there is vascularization of the cornea, there is loss of luster, there is conjunctivalization, but in addition, you will notice that the eye is extremely dry, which is not typically a feature of LSCD after chemical burns, after ocular allergy, after ocular surgeries. So these are the kinds of cases where one needs to be extra careful because if you have a dry surface with LSCD, the causes are very different, the way you approach it is very different, and the management is very different. So this particular patient has uh, 
a severe dry eye, has cicatrization, you can see almost no fornices, the fornices are obliterated and in addition has limbal stem cell deficiency. So two major conditions which cause this kind of a picture are mucous membrane pemphigoid or what is also alternatively known as OCP or cicatricial pemphigoid and after Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So these are the two conditions one needs to keep in mind if you see a patient of LSCD with a dry surface and cicatrization on the eye. And if they go untreated, this is what one ends up with. One ends up with a bone dry eye with what we call a dermalization of the surface. There's not just the conjunctival phenotype of epithelium, it's actually like skin. Mm -hmm. So it's pop parchment like. Uh, one can confirm the diagnosis with a variety of tools using impression cytology, using histopathology, and these features have been well described by the group from Hyderabad. But even otherwise, clinically, the features are so evident that making a diagnosis of LSCD is not difficult. What are the causes of limbal stem cell deficiency? We'll see how, we saw what are limbal stem cells, we saw what is LSCD, how it looks in the clinic, how to confirm in the laboratory. So what causes LSCD? So typically, till very recently, if you picked up a good textbook, they were categorized like this. And most of these come from Western data. So uh, it's difficult to make out with such small sample sizes what actually are the major contributors to LSCD. And things like aniridia, neurotrophic keratopathy, idiopathic are not what we correlate with in the clinic. You see them very rarely. So what do we see actually? So this is a study that was published this year in the AJO, a very big data set uh, from two centers of LVPEI, so over 1,300 patients. And what we found that uh, there are very easily identifiable causes, whether it is unilateral limbal stem cell deficiency or bilateral LSCD. So if you look at unilateral LSCD, almost always, eight out of 10 times, more than that, the, the cause is ocular surface burns. So chemical burns, thermal burns, a combination of these, chuna injuries, blast injuries, and we further categorize the offending chemical also. And then come the other rarer causes, but more often than not, unilateral LSCD is due to chemical burns in our cohort. Compared to this, the causes of bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency are very, very different. So yes, chemical and thermal burns are an important cause. That is the part of the pie chart in blue, but equally important are the parts in red and green, which are respectively the allergic eye disease, the VKC and AKC component, as well as the cicatrizing eye diseases such as SJS, 10, and mucous membrane pemphigoid. So these are as important as surface burns when you're looking at a patient with bilateral limbal stem cell deficiency. So an important distinction to make between unilateral and bilateral cases. And this also shows us that something which we consider as a relatively benign or innocuous condition such as VKC, can have blinding consequences such as LSCD, and it does have such consequences. What is the management? It depends. But what we should know is that keratoplasty does not work. So if you have a patient who looks like this, please do not expect the cornea surgeon to perform a keratoplasty, because 10 times out of 10, it will fail. The management depends on whether it is a wet surface or a dry surface. And I'm already on to the second talk of the session. So in terms of time, I hope it is all right, because the second talk was management of limbal stem cell deficiency. So if it is a wet surface, typically what you see after ocular surface burns, or whether it is a dry surface like after SJS, you have very, very different modes of management. So for a wet surface, you need to know whether it is unilateral or bilateral LSCD, whether it is partial or whether it is total. So partial unilateral LSCD, applying amniotic membrane after removing the panis is one option. But in the long term, without providing a source of stem cells, the panis is likely to come back more often than not. Likewise, for total LSCD, if you just remove it and put amniotic membrane, maybe for some time you'll have the cornea which looks good, but eventually it will recur. So the solution here is to take a source of stem cells mo most easily available from the other eye and do a limbal stem cell transplantation along with the amniotic membrane as a scaffold. And then if you have a stromal scar or a stromal component to the disease, you may, in addition, use a lamellar or a penetrating keratoplasty. If you have a wet surface with bilateral total limbal stem cell deficiency, one of the options is to do an allogenic limbal stem cell transplantation using a donor source, but then you have to use systemic immunosuppression. The other option is to do a type 1 Boston keratoprosthesis. This in itself is a large topic, so I won't be going into the details of capro surgery. But this is the algorithm. If it is a bone dry surface, which of these options are applicable? Well, none of these options are applicable because whether you do amniotic membrane application, 
whether you do stem cell transplantation or whether you do type 1 Boston Capro surgery, all of these will fail because they require the surface to be wet, they require the phonesis to be formed, the adnexa to be good. So the only option here, if the underlying disease is well controlled, is to do something called an osteoodontokeratoprosthesis or other forms of similar keratoprosthesis surgery such as type 2 Boston Capro surgery or now we have the LVP Capro surgery. So these are the options for a bone dry surface, bilateral total LSCD. So this is a patient, a 30 year old man with alkali burns with near total limbal stem cell deficiency and a stromal scar. So the options here could be a direct limbal transplant from the other eye, which is known as a conjunctival limbal autograft. But you take up so much of the limbus from the other eye that you may induce a limbal stem cell deficiency in the other eye. The other conventional option was to do a CLET, which has been done successfully at Hyderabad for more than a decade, the series of more than 700 patients, where you take a very small bit of limbus from the donor eye, amplify those cells in a lab, then put back the epithelial sheet on the affected eye after removing the panis. The only problem here is the cost and the, uh, the logistics of having a stem cell lab, which means that maybe there are three or four centers across the world which offer this. So for most of our patients, it's not practical to offer this therapy, although it works very well. So SLET, as Dr. Chatterjee, ref Chatterjee referred to, uh, is now no longer very recent. The first paper was published in 2011, and it combines the best of both worlds. You have a surgery which takes very small pieces of limbus from the donor eye and it amplifies this limbus on the surface itself of the recipient eye. So it is in vivo expansion of limbal stem cells. It does not require a sophisticated stem cell lab. It does not require any sophisticated equipment. All it requires is good training, amniotic membrane, fibrin glue, and you're done. So just a basic set of surgical instruments, fibrin glue, amniotic membrane. Coming back to this patient, so similar to what Dr. Samrat Chatterjee was showing, we take a very small bit of limbus from the other eye and that is the limbal biopsy. The key here is not to damage the clear cornea because you need just the limbus, not the corneal cells. So you take the biopsy, cut it up into small pieces. I'll rush through the video because you've already shown, uh, have been shown a good video. And then you start the panis dissection on the other eye, typically away from the limbus, three to four millimeters away, do a peritomy. Uh, control the bleeding, achieve hemostasis, then using a combination of sharp and blunt dissection, peel the panis, dissect it off the corneal surface. The aim here is not to aim for a clear, crystal clear cornea. If there is an underlying stromal opacity, let it be there. Then put the amniotic membrane on top, use fibrin glue to secure the slit transplants, and put a bandage contact lens on the, at, at the end of surgery. Postoperatively, because it's an autologous transplantation, you do not need systemic therapy, topical antibiotics and steroids in tapering doses. This is how the eye typically looks at one week, at six weeks, and after that for long term. So ra uh, rather than looking at case reports or case series, uh, we decided to look at what are the outcomes across centers across the world. So we had seven centers from three countries who participated in this study on autologous sled performed for unilateral LSCD. And what we found, and this is a breakup of the centers that participated, you can see the cases are pretty much evenly distributed, that the success rates are very good. They are close to 80% in terms of functional success. Close to 80% of patients will recover a corneal phenotype of epithelium and an equal number will get more than, uh, about 67% had visual acuity of more than 2200 and similar number more than two lines of visual improvement. And this was a study across countries, across continents. So it works pretty much anywhere in the world. So this is as good or slightly better than the results that have been published for cultivated limbal transplantation or CLET, but at the same time it is much less expensive and it is a single stage surgery. Coming back to this four year old boy that we started off with, so he underwent SLET with conjunctival autografts superiorly and inferiorly and this is the result after surgery. And, uh, the as you can imagine, the patient and the family was very happy. Uh, this was published as a case report in 2013. Subsequently, we have dealt with quite a lot of patients in the extreme end of the spectrum of limbal stem cell deficiency. This is one of the first cases that I encountered as faculty at WISAG with LVP, similar situation. This was toilet cleaner injury at school. And this patient presented like this to us. <coughs> and there's obviously no cornea visible. This is how it looked after surgery. So sometimes the results can be quite, quite gratifying and magical, right?
So a recurrence of LSCD post slate where we decided to do a corneal transplant along with slate and again the eye did very well, right? Few more cases. Uh, this is a patient from rural Gujarat, rural Rajasthan who came to me at Ahmedabad and had three prior surgeries in this eye. I don't know what the surgeries were, but you can see that you pretty much can't see the ocular surface. The, everything is stuck to the globe. The skin is covering the globe. And for these cases, you need not just slit, you also need conjunctival autograft. Sometimes you need mucous membrane autographs to reconstruct the fornix, fornix and the tarsal surfaces. But if you do it well, the results are gratifying. So this patient continues to follow up with me without any need for a keratoplasty. And the message here is that after slit, quite a lot of the stromal opacities tend to fade over time. And the hypothesis is that along with epithelial stem cells, we are also providing mesenchymal stem cells from the limbus. And that is how the scars become less with time. So now the rate of keratoplasty post limbal stem cell transplantation is very, very, very low. Whether is it, it is at Hyderabad or other surgeons who are doing it, you just keep following these patients over time and the surface improves, the stromal opacity also improves. I'll end with this one case. Uh, this young man had a bilateral boiler blast injury. Uh, there's an industrial town called Morbi in Gujarat where this happened. And uh, this is about 14 months post the injury. I had done central tarsoraphies for non-healing epithelial defects. You can see pretty much total LSCD in both eyes. So you don't have an option of taking limbus from the healthy eye and doing it for the other eye. But here what we decided to do after a discussion about either an allogenic slit or a Boston type 1 K-Pro, we decided to do an allogenic slit using donor limbal tissue from his father. And here the difference is that unlike autologous transplants, these have to be treated pretty much the same as you would treat a renal transplant or an organ transplant that in the sense that they need immunosuppression. And uh, I was lucky to have worked in a couple of places where I was familiar with the use of these drugs. If you're not very familiar, you can work with a transplant uh, uh, immunologist or a rheumatologist who will help you give these drugs. But you need to give them because if you don't give immunosuppression, they fail. So this patient was started on cyclosporin, azathioprine, and systemic steroid. The systemic steroid was withdrawn over a period of three months, but the patient continued to be on cyclosporin and as a thyperin. Without this, the transplant won't work. And then the topical therapy is pretty much the same as an autologous slit. But post-operative day one, we decided to operate on the worst eye, which was the right eye. You can see some blood under the amniotic membrane. The transplants are visible on the surface. On day 10, it is clearing and the vision is improving. By three months, he is 20-20, right? But he has to be on immunosuppression. And at 12 months, he's still 20-20. The dose of cyclosporin can now be reduced and we decided to reduce it to 75 milligrams per day. So this is an example of allogenic slit. So the key take home messages from my talk that I would like to leave you with is that limbal stem cell deficiency is a well-defined entity and diagnosis can be made easily in the clinic. Ocular surface burns, VKC and SJS are the leading causes of LSCD in our country and we have good data for this. The paper is out, I'll share it with you if you need it. The management depends on the type of surface, whether it is dry or wet, whether it is partial or total limbal stem cell deficiency, and whether it is unilateral or bilateral. And it is these three factors that determine what you will do to help the patient get good vision. SLET is a novel, inexpensive technique and a single stage technique that can successfully replenish the corneal surface and restore vision. And this has been replicated all over the world. So this is pretty much the de facto technique for limbal stem cell transplantation now. And most of the credit for that, all of the credit for that goes to Dr. Virinder Sangwan, who developed the technique at Hyderabad, who is now at Delhi. So with that thought, I'll uh, say thank you. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take. There is one more topic, if we have time, that keeps us from the very interesting session on legal issues in ophthalmology is recent advances in management of dry eye. So I'll be focusing on the newer drugs and newer modalities, not so much on the diagnostic part. So the first recent advance is the definition. So the definition of dry eye disease keeps on getting updated. The Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society is a group that meets and comes out with the documents regarding the definition, classification, recommended treatment, etc. And this is the dues group the dry eye workshop and the second workshop was held recently and the results were published in 2017. So you have components like a loss of homeostasis of the tear film, the patient has symptoms, there is tear film instability, hyperosmolarity, surface inflammation, neurosensory abnormalities, etc., etc. 
What I want to stress on is that TFOS is a group that has significant industry backing, and therefore please read these reports, take away whatever you want to take away, but take it with a pinch of salt. So you will notice that earlier when you did not have methods to measure hyperosmolarity, you did not have this in the definition, okay? So whenever you have newer diagnostic or therapeutic modalities, it does influence what the recommendations tell us. So straight away coming to the therapeutic approaches for dry eye, I've just listed what can you do for a patient who has dry eye. So you can suppress the surface inflammation, whatever little tears there are, try to conserve it, minimize the exposure, protect the surface, provide lubrication from outside, reduce the loss of the tears and try to simulate secretion. So these are the approaches. And then we work on the specific modalities to help achieve these goals. So conventionally, uh, we have lubricant eye drops and ointments, we have topical steroids to reduce the surface inflammation, topical cyclosporin, secretagogues like pilocarpin, punctal occlusion, and similar approaches. So what are the recent additions to this armamentarium of tools? We have some new drugs, some of them are available in India, so chloroquine eye drops are now available for the past few years in India, and the manufacturer claims that these are anti-inflammatory, they uh, protect against the apoptosis on the surface, and they, if you look at the data, what the manufacturer will provide you, uh, you'll typically see two studies published in journals that you would not otherwise read, and what is interesting is that the data set used in both the papers is exactly the same, the authors are the same, the text is the same, the tables is this are the same, and the conclusions are the same. What concerns me is that apart from the bad methodology in these studies, the maximum duration that the drug has been evaluated for is 21 days, and no one treats dry eye only for 21 days. More pertinently, chloroquine is an amphiphilic drug, and it penetrates very easily into all the layers of the cornea. And we've now known for 20, 30, 40 years that it can cause deposits in all layers of the stroma right up to the Desmase membrane. Chloroquine retinopathy is a very well-known entity. So if we keep using these drops, which may or may not be effective for a long period of time for our patients, I don't know what will happen to their corneas and retinas. So as of now, I'm not using chloroquine eye drops unless we have better evidence. And the second new drug that we have is repabimide, which was initially used by gastroenterologists, mainly in Japan and in other parts of Asia as a, as a mucoprotective agent in gastric ulcers and gastritis, and it is believed to increase the mucin levels, and then the ophthalmologists there decided to do trials in the eye, and the results are encouraging. If you look at the studies, most of them are from Japan, some from good reputed groups, and there are two randomized studies. Uh, whether you look at the objective measures or the subjective symptoms, the graphs show improvement. But again, when you're looking at these colors and the graphs, it's important to know that while a result may be statistically significant, your p-value may be significant, how significant is a change, say, in Shermer's score from four to six, or a staining score which improves by a couple of points, and whether that actually contributes to the comfort of your patient. So that is a decision the clinic clinician has to take. So statistically, yes, there are improvements, and some of the colleagues who are using these drops, uh, particularly in the cases which have filaments, report that when used in addition to your usual therapy, the filaments tend to decrease. But it's not a magical drug by any stretch of the imagination. This one, lifetigrast, also basically acts on the inflammatory component of dry eye, and uh, there's a lot of excitement in the US pharma industry. The st stock uh, prices of the company which launched this has gone up because it's the first new FDA approval in many, many years, but we have no experience in India. The results again indicate a slightly incremental improvements in signs and symptoms. Similar for diquafosol, uh, this also promotes tear film and mucin secretion, but again, for us, it is theoretical because we don't have access to it. What we do have access to and what companies are promoting is, for the past few years now, our treatments such as LipiFlow, which provide thermal pulses to the eyelids, and they claim it is useful for evaporative dry eye, where the meibomian glands can be expressed out very nicely with these treatments. But the same can be achieved with these off-the-shelf goggles or, you know, heating pads which are available on Amazon and Flipkart for a few hundred bucks. The problem with LipiFlow is that the treatments are significantly expensive and it basically achieves the same thing that you achieve with a good warm compress and a massage. So that is my take on LipiFlow. 
Intense pulse light therapy or IPL therapy, again, is being promoted aggressively at meetings across uh, the country these days. So the background to this is the dermatologists use IPL therapy for cases of rosacea. And uh, even they don't know exactly how it works, but it decreases the vascularization and the vascularity and the lesions and the comedones heal. And they incidentally found that patients with rosacea being treated with IPL also had improvement in their meibomian gland dysfunction or MGD, and that is how the treatment came into ophthalmology, right? So again, the problem here is the cost per treatment and how long it lasts, we don't know. So the reason but the recent uh, DUCE2 report has this summary and it recommends that this is the algorithm to approach a patient in terms of diagnosis and classification and this is how you treat the patient. So I am a reasonably well-read and academically oriented cornea specialist but even I find it very difficult to read these charts. So I don't expect people to actually follow these charts. So I have come out with a very simple approach which I use in the clinic and which helps me avoid blunders in the clinic when I'm seeing patients of dry eye. So you have a spectrum of disease when you're talking about dry eye and to me there are three parts to this spectrum. So start with you have dry eye question mark. Is it actually dry eye or is it something else? The second is definitely the patient has dry eye and the third is the patient has dry eye but the patient also has something else, right? So these are the three categories of patients that you would find in your clinic. The first category, unfortunately, is the most common and uh, probably I don't have to deal with these patients as much as you do because I get patients who are referred. So mine is more of a referral practice. But for a comprehensive ophthalmologist, these are the kind of patients who keep filling up your OPDs. They have symptoms, but they don't have signs. So your Sherma test, your breakup time, your fluorescein staining, your Rose Bengal staining, everything is normal. But the patient is miserable. So quite a lot of these patients are IT professionals and some of them are not. Quite a lot of these patients are patients who have done cataract surgery in one eye and they keep complaining about that eye or refractive surgery in both eyes. So there is definitely something going on with the ocular surface, but it is not dry eye. They do not have aqueous deficiency. Most of them do not have ev evaporative dry eye, but something is wrong. The problem is we as ophthalmologists don't know what is wrong. So for this, my best recommendation is to give them a lot of chair time, be empathetic and give whatever placebo you are comfortable with. A good caveat here, an important caveat, is to rule out a condition called ocular neuropathic pain, which is actually a well-defined condition, and there are papers in recent years where the patient has a neurogenic pain very similar to other forms of neuralgia, like post zoster or other parts of the body. So there are two types of ocular neuropathic pain, one which originates from the peripheral nociceptors on the corneal and the conjunctival surface, the other where the pathway is more central or peripheral to the, or more central are, uh, are responsible. So very simple way to distinguish is if you put a drop of proparacaine and the pain subsides, it is the peripheral receptors which are responsible. If the pain still does not subside, it is somewhere down the neurogenic pathways that the problem lies. And the treatment for this is essentially the same as the treatment for other forms of neurogenic pain, which is you will have drugs like amitriptyline, gabapentin, a neurologist can help you with that. So please rule out ocular neuropathic pain in these patients. For the rest of the patients, we continue to struggle. Okay, the second part of the spectrum is patients who have definite dry eye. So this can be uh, aqueous deficiency, this can be evaporative, but most often it is a combination of both. It's very difficult to find patients who have isolated evaporative dry eye or isolated aqueous deficiency dry eye. So my tips here are, Please examine how often the patient is blinking, how well the patient is blinking, look at the eyelashes, lid margins, conjunctiva, everything systematically because you have agents like Demodex which infest the lashes and can cause dry, evaporative dry eye. You have MGD and you need to do a systemic examination because the patients can have primary or secondary Sjogren syndrome. Management is with lubricant eye drops, topical steroids in short courses and cyclosporin in selective cases. This is a sequence of questions we get asked very often at meetings. So is one lubricant better than another? No. All of them are pretty much the same. Do you need preservative-free medication? You need them in very few cases where the patient is in intolerant to preservatives. Oral pyrocarpine pretty much is not very useful apart from very, very early cases. Likewise for topical cyclosporin. There is a good trial published in the NEJM which conclusively shows that omega-3 fatty acids, oral supplementation has absolutely no role in dry eye. 
And punctal plugs, while are useful in some cases, are quite expensive and over a period of time tend to be uh, use useless. So dry eye plus, and this is where I'll sign off, I'll say that we miss three conditions quite often. One is primary or secondary Sjogren's syndrome. So if a patient in addition to dry eye has tissue distraction, if the patient has scleritis, PUK, melting of the cornea, this indicates that the patient needs aggressive and prolonged systemic immuno immunomodulatory therapy, not just to save the eye, but also to save the life of the patient. Because Dr. Foster from Boston has shown that if you don't treat these patients, a large amount of them will go on to death over a period of time because this indicates ongoing inflammatory activity. The second thing we often miss is cicatrizing disease. So if you have fornicial shortening, uh, scarring of the conjunctiva, you have particularly the uh, caruncular keratinization or cicatrization. So please refer these patients to a person who knows how to deal with OCP. There's a role for biopsy. There is a definite role for systemic immunomodulatory therapy. And if you don't treat these patients, uh, they go on to develop an eye which looks like the image on the extreme right. The third condition that is often missed is Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So the patient these days with good ICU treatments recovers very well systemically, but there are sequelae in the eye which need management. The eyelids margins become very rough. There is a progressive keratopathy, progressive dryness of the eye, and the end-state disease, often the patient ends up with the picture that looks like the lady on the right side. So lid margin MMG is something you need to do for these patients. I won't go into the surgical technique, but it has a protective effect. I'll skip the video because we're out of time. It has a protective effect on the ocular surface and the patient can maintain a good cornea which is stable for years together. In addition to using scleral contact lenses, this is the other modality that is useful. Then there are extreme cases which may benefit from things like a minor salivary gland transplantation. Again, I'm going to skip the video, but you can take uh, salivary glands from the buccal mucosa or the labial mucosa, transplant them into the inferior or the superior fornix. In carefully selected cases of SJS, they improve the symptoms of the patient and also the surface staining. Dr. J.S., right. please sum up, okay. because time is quite extended. Yeah. Huh? So to sum up, dry eye is not one disease. Please categorize the dry eye by severity and do not miss the inflammatory causes of dry eye, the cicatrizing eye disease. There's a range of treatment options available and treatment may be life-saving, not just vision-safe. Thank you. Thank you.